The Poor Historians Podcast is brought to you by Artery Inc., a local homegrown Milwaukee company specializing in anatomical art-inspired apparel and products. Not only do we love their stuff, but we love what the company does for the community. In 2022, they supported over 20 unique nonprofit organizations in and around our area with over $36,000 in donations, so they're good people too. So go to www.arteryinc.com, that's arteryinc.com, Use our promo code PHPOD, all one word, at checkout to save 10% on orders over $35. And just so you know, it does not include subscription boxes. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. At a medical school graduation many, many years ago, around the time that movies could appear in color, a pair of young medical students on the cusp of becoming doctors stand with their classmates to take the solemn Hippocratic Oath. As I look out among the sea of future healers, I am inspired, despite this class's impressively mediocre board scores on the average, by the new generation to be welcomed into the house of medicine. After all the tests and practicals and all the dissections and all the clerkship hours, I stand before you all with humility and most likely no debt from medical school, which is not the same I could say for all of you. <laughs> I guess points for honesty. Uh, yeah, talk about having it easy. I have like hundreds of dollars of medical school debt. I'm sure I'll pay it off eventually. Hey, those are $1973. We'll be fine. Oh, wait. Shh. He might hear us. And now it's time to ask all the soon-to-be physicians in the audience to rise and take our profession's most solemn oath, the Hippocratic um, Oath. Wow. All of medical school and we're finally at this moment. Yeah, it's really powerful stuff. It's about to happen. All those about to receive your medical degrees, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear. I swear. By Apollo the Physician. By, by Apollo, Apollo the, the, the physician? physician and Asclepius. By, by Asclepius. Asclepius? What? Huh? And Hygieia and Panacea and all the gods and goddesses as my witness. Wait, wait, who? What is happening? I will hold him who taught me this art equally dear to me as my parents to be a partner in life with him and to fulfill his needs when required. Does this mean that our anatomy professors are family now? Yeah, and what does it mean that we'll fulfill their needs? That, mm, that line seems kind of sketch. That, that I will I not will use the knife even upon those suffering from stones, but will leave this to those who are trained in the craft. There goes my plan to be a urologist. Maybe Hippocrates was advocating for some proper oversight in medical training. Yeah, so I can use all the needles I want without training, but knives are off limits? None of this makes sense. Did I miss the first do no harm part? Yeah, what gives? Did they read this before having legions of physicians recite it? What, what are we doing here? I don't know, but I think this ceremony is almost over. Do you want to hop in my brand new Ford Ranchero and go find a roller rink or something? I heard they have the latest pinball games there. <sighs> Far out, man. Groovy. Not that old. Hey, Aaron, you want to take this oath over here? <laughs> yeah, well, what oath are you talking about? Oath of D's nuts. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's pretty much on point for you, Mike. Yeah, let's just go to the roller rink, okay? Welcome, everyone. This is Port Historians, the podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, are you ready to swear something something oaths? I swear all the time, Max. Mm. (laughs) All the time. Mike doesn't swear. I don't swear, and I'm not ready. Well, there is nothing I can do about that, so we're going to have to press on. Uh, do we have any shout-outs, any news today? I don't know if we do, actually. We're probably forgetting somebody. 
All right. It's so. a professional group here, Brian. You're going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> We're really on top Zero of it. Zero no, I like shout it. Outs. You, just, you Sometimes do it live. Sometimes we batch I like things. That. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We batch things. You know, it just we see where we end up. All right. Well, maybe we don't have any shout outs. You don't always have shout outs. I mean, sometimes you have shout outs. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's just quiet time. <laughs> but then other times you, you invite a guest onto the show. And so we have a guest with us here today. And I would like to introduce him now. So uh, we are here today with Dr. Brian Elliott, who is an active duty Air Force internist uh, in uh, his chief residency year, as it were. Uh, he graduated with honors from Jefferson, Jefferson Medical College, where he was awarded the William F. Kello Prize for representing the attributes of an ideal physician. He attended residency at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Wright State University, where he received the Commendation Medal for Outstanding Service. And he's currently serving as chief resident, as I mentioned before. He goes off to Walter Reed National Medical Center for Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellowship. And somehow, somehow, in between all of that, you know, when he's not doctoring or reading medical history, he somehow writes a book between medical school and residency. Brian, what gives? <laughs> well, when you care about something a lot, I guess you, you carve out a little bit of time to do something like that. And uh, I'm excited for time? today because this is probably one of my favorite topics in the book. So, Brian, tell us a little bit about the book that you wrote, What are the, the chapter I pulled out of that book for this episode. Uh, what is the book that you wrote? So the book's called White Coat Ways. Uh, about five years ago, I thought about all these things as I was going through medical school. I thought about the white coat ceremony that we go through, the Hippocratic Oath that we all take when we go through medical school. And I said, huh, I wonder where these things come from and should we really keep doing them? And I go through seven medical traditions in the book from things like those two that I, I just discussed and talk about where they come from and whether or not they should continue. And uh, your book is coming out when now? January 27th. Ooh, January coming up. 27th. Cool. Where can Com we find it? it? Is definitely yeah. coming up. Uh, it is, it's available for pre-order now, actually, on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. This is one of those topics that we're going to talk about today that I... I kind of heard rumblings here and there about how it may not be what we all think it is. And I was really glad for the opportunity not only to review the chapter and use it for the show, but to actually dive into the Hippocratic Oath with somebody who's done way more research on it than, than I have. So with that, I, I'm going to kind of start out by asking both the audience and my co-hosts a question. So what do you guys know about the Hippocratic Oath? Off the top of your head, did you guys take it on your way out of medical school or do you remember this occasion with reverence? I, I I remember kind of thinking that it was supposed to feel like a bigger deal than it was, you know, yeah, like the white coat yeah, ceremony yeah. and all that. It's like, oh, yeah. you finally made it. And then you do it and like, they just hand yeah. you a white coat and you go sit yeah. down. But no, uh, I, 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 yeah, I took it. I took it. I, I remember much more about where it was. And my son at the time was having a tantrum. So he was, <sighs> I think. So you didn't listen to the oath. Seven. No, your... like really what it was is like we have a bunch of photos of my wife being incredibly crabby with my son who's like obviously just been crying and me in my gown and all of us saying, can we go home now? And then that's, <laughs> so I really don't have much memory of it at all. But what, yeah. Do you know if you took the Hippocratic Oath or I like I, the I modified? Think it was, I think you it was modified. Took a modified one. It was clearly yeah, it was definitely a modified like one. Like I looked it up and <laughs> there's no way that I didn't it say doesn't this. even make any <laughs> sense. <laughs> That's we're obviously going to dive into it quite a bit. So I, I did not take the standard oath. We'll mention this a little bit later, and we'll mention why. But uh, we'll we'll get into it when we get into it. So this is kind of a big thing. You always hear about doctors. You know, they took the Hippocratic oath. You took the oath. So let's let's kind of break this down a little bit. So I was reading the chapter in Brian's book here about the Hippocratic oath, and I was again, I was trying to remember myself. Like I don't really remember taking this, and here's why. You know, so I do remember a graduation ceremony. I remember you know saying words and reciting words and those sort of things. But I think we've alluded to this once or twice before. I did do something oathy on that day, but I also <laughs> went to DO school. So I went to an oath -like. osteopathic school. And don't worry, I, I, we keep teasing this. I absolutely will deliver the uh -huh. episode on osteopathic medicine in the future. Uh -huh. uh, and it's, it's already in my crosshairs here. But for what it, we, we had our own oath that we took, which was sort of... <laughs> equally kind of uh, had its own crazy moments, and we're going to talk about it later. But that being said, I had to take an oath. You, you, doctor, you don't get to be a doctor without an oath. Is that true, Brian? That's pretty much true. You have to oath. oath what, was your, what was your oath experience, Brian? Did you take the... I, I took a one created by my medical school, 
at least you know looking back on it i, I now know a lot of, about it and can look back and be like okay that definitely wasn't the original and it wasn't some of the other ones that we'll talk about but it was it was crafted by my medical school hmm. were you did, did was this chapter written before or after you took set of uh after no oh, it'd be fun if you'd written it beforehand you're like nope hey wait <laughs> nope <laughs> excuse me middle. actually <laughs> if you well actually the master of ceremonies during the oath brian that'd be epic it'd just be epic <laughs> So the first thing most medical and non-medical people may say about this hallowed oath is like the, you say, like, what's the oath or what do you remember? Usually most people will say primum non no cherry. Is that how you say it? No cherry? Sure. No cherry. And it's, it's no Latin. Cherry. Nobody knows. It's a Latin type language. for, quote, first do no harm, except no, that's it's actually not part of the Hippocratic Oath. And it doesn't appear in there at, really at all. It comes from a different body of work, doesn't it, Brian? What, can you tell us a little bit about where where did it get pulled from? Yeah, so when we look back at all the works done by, quote, Hippocrates, we're pretty much certain that they're not written by one person. They're a body of works referred to as the Corpus Hippocraticum, or the Hippocratic Corpus, and that encompasses about 60 to 70 treatises. Um, we at least know of 60, and there are probably more, but they almost certainly weren't written by one person, one Hippocrates, because they span such a large amount of time. They vary in the way that they were written. They use different vocabularies. The things that they did for medical practice varied a lot from even just treatise to treatise. So hmm. we think this is more likely a group of people that ascribe to the Hippocratic way of healing. The thought that diseases weren't from the gods, they were natural and related to the four humors, which could be a whole episode in itself. Oh, it was. From that Hippocratic corpus, there's the oath. But prima non nocere, which is, you know, the do no harm statement actually comes from a different part, which is of the epidemics. They talk about in terms of disease, do no, do two things to help or at least to do no harm. And we think about that in terms of the Hippocratic Oath because we took it, we stole it, and then we put it into more modern oaths when in actuality it was never in there. <laughs> Basically, the uh, the way I hear this is that the Hippocratic Corpus, the the collection of treatises that come that that, that this uh the l famous line that we're all talking about came from so it's like a committee committee of different people putting in <laughs> stuff and they're all they all want to contribute so you like i got a treatise you got a treatise everybody gets almost a like a like a joint committee that over there we go, there uh, we go. So, so you no. get this big committee writing this this uh series of documents and then later it gets butchered and pulled apart and <laughs> and then nobody knows who wrote it until somebody like Brian here sits down and goes, wait, wait a second, what's happening? And we like go through this, but it becomes this culture. It becomes part of what we you kind of think physicians, you think this oath and like, we're already off to a bad start because everybody quotes this line and it's not really part of the actual Hippocratic oath itself. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like if your research advisor took all of your works and then said, I'm just going to put my name on all these. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where I the term know. hypocrite comes from? Like it's actually <laughs> misrepresenting something that existed. I that's a good question. I did, I I don't know how I never thought of a hypocrite joke uh, until this it moment. Wasn't really a joke. It. It's more so as a. Well, question. I mean, just as a as something to bring up. I never. I would have looked into it if I would have thought of it, but I didn't. Hmm. Did you come across, across what a hypocrite is in relation to Hippocratic oaths in in your research, I, Brian? I did not. No, that's a very interesting question, and now mm -hmm. I'll have to look it up. Could be unrelated. Let's all go on a Probably tangent unrelated. for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so if the Hippocratic Oath doesn't start with the first do no harm bit, yeah, what does it begin with? Well, I'll spare the listener the entirety of the oath, but even the opening gives a hint of how outdated this uh, 20, 2,500 year old pledge is. So it begins, quote, I swear by Apollo the physician and Asclepius and health and all heal and all the gods and goddesses that according to my ability and judgment, I will keep this oath and the stipulation to reckon him who taught me this art equally dear to me as my parents, to share my substance with him and relieve his necessities if required. Brian, what does it mean to relieve my teachers of their necessities? I am concerned. <laughs> <laughs> it is a extreme form of mentorship in which you get financial compensation from your students, or at least most scholars looking back at this think that it was created to mean financially relieve your teachers. Okay. Well, heck, no, we still do that. Hold on. Wait a second. What? Oh, yeah. I was like, oh, that's so primitive. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That's what we do now. Is that why we have debt? 
that's what the oath means is you're oathing to debt. Isn't it funny too? Because with residency, like you go work for your mentor and then the government pays, but they pay a portion of your salary to the institution. So maybe they're <laughs> just following the Hippocratic Oath. They give you some breadcrumbs to live on, barely. <laughs> it's, this might I be too soon for Brian yeah, yeah. To, to, to really go into this in great detail. <laughs> Starting to sweat. No, Brian Smart, he's in the military. He's, oh, yeah. He you're... doesn't have to worry about Oh, this. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Still. Yeah, Walter. You can't just walk into Walter Reed and and, and you know without having yeah. some credentials, as far as I'm aware. It's a different kind of debt. Yeah, yeah. That's a fair way to say it. Yeah. All right. So, Hippocrates wanted us to go into debt for medicine. I. This is inescapable. Hey. Anyway, so there's there's that's just kind of the scratching of the surface, right? There's more insanity <laughs> in this oath, right? There, there's there's, and, and trust me, just verify this, read it for yourself. But the Hippocratic oath includes phrases suggesting things like the person taking the oath will teach medicine to the sons of physicians for free uh, that didn't happen for me i don't know about you guys well, but it still uh, happens not, yeah yeah like, so you know somebody it's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of true but uh, it also says you should not give quote deadly medicine to anyone okay mm. that's uh, mm. there are probably degrees of so you uh, can't give coumadin anymore Damn it. Yeah, I guess not. I guess not. <laughs> well, stop uh, Sucks no choline. It, nope. Mm-hmm. Can't also do it. Uh, says you should not use a pessary to produce an abortion. And a pessary is a device that can go into the, the vaginal canal. And usually we think of pessaries as like holding up the bladder when it starts uh, prolapsing or where, you know, over time those tissues basically become lax. And so, you know, can cause problems. The, the bladder that's sitting down there can kind of... Uh, start laying into the vagina and that sort of thing. So you use a pessary. But here we're talking about pessaries and abortions, which... You know, that sounds a, like birth a, control, actually. That, I mean... Very certain, specific certain conclusion way. there. No, yeah, the pet, yeah. Well, the, and the oath also says we will refrain from, quote, the seduction of females or males of free men and slaves, end quote. And so I... I mean, I, I guess it's good to have it in there, but mm-hmm. uh, it, it's... I don't remember saying that. A, uh, did you guys say that out loud uh, to, to at your med school graduation? Like I said, not that I recall. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like it's reasonable advice, uh, but I don't know that it's one of those recognized parts of the oath that we're always talking about and referring to. And uh, and then, uh, of course, you know, th- there's parts in there like one will not become a urologist. Quote, I will not cut persons laboring under the stone, end quote. And that seems really strange to cast a whole cast shade on a whole branch of medicine, right? With all these bits, right, they, they seem a little bit silly in modern context. There's some sprinkles of the reasonable ethics, like I alluded to, and they suggested kind of including, you know, thing, other things, right? Like pe- keeping a patient secrets, accepting consequences for conducting oneself poorly, and you know, avoiding voluntary acts of, quote, mischief and corruption, end quote. That's all. Hey, that all seems reasonable, right? I think we, we can then eh, oath being something where you say that out loud and like, yeah, let's, let's be ethical. That That's reasonable. But I, I do wonder what would constitute an involuntary act of mischief and corruption in fairness. I, I feel like they happen, but I can't think off the top of my head what they would be. Like going to a restaurant inadvertently sitting down at a drug rep dinner. Ah, there we go. That's <laughs> Hippocrates and, or the, the committee to write the Hippocratic oath probably didn't see that one coming. Mm-hmm. There's also some credible research suggesting that Hippocrates, well, as you kind of said, Brian, he didn't really write this oath himself. So a leading theory, as you mentioned in the book, seems to be like that uh, you mentioned Pythagoras. And tell us a little bit about about that. At least, you know, so you bring up Pythagoras, and at least that's just kind of a prominent hypotenuse put forth by researchers on the matter that he could have uh, he could have contributed to this oath. Yeah, so if we look back at the Hippocratic Corpus, they kind of categorized things as this was very probably written by Hippocrates. This was maybe written by Hippocrates, and this was almost certainly not written by Hippocrates. And the oath falls in the maybe to not realm of things. Because while it was probably written around 400 to 500 uh, BCE, we're talking about the father of medicine, the founder, Hippocrates, writing something that is the creed for all physicians, And then there was no mention of it for 500 years. The first time somebody mentioned it was first century CE. The first partial copy we have isn't until around 300 CE. And then the first copy that we have, the full copy, isn't until about the 10th century. Hmm. So it would be weird that he would write something so profound and nobody would talk about it for centuries. 
So <laughs> Pythagoras is one of those theories of who potentially could have written it instead. So Ludwig Edelson, who's the scholar who came up with this theory that Pythagoras wrote the Hippocratic Oath, um, and I'll, I'll clarify by saying that most scholars describe this as, well, I would describe it as a hot take in terms of scholarly work on Hippocrates. Mm, scholarly hot takes. I like it. Love it. What was what was Twitter in the 10th century? <laughs> this this would have trended for sure. Um, <laughs> Might be valued more then too. If uh, Ludwig Edelson basically looks back at the ideals expressed in the oath, all these things that you talked about that are way out there, and said that Hippocrates probably didn't write this because other works that are genuinely attributed to him do not forbid these. In fact, they even performed abortions in some of the other treatises in the Hippocratic Corpus that were more likely written by Hippocrates. So Mm -hmm. he looked for other schools of thought that lined up with all the things said. And the most prominent of which was the Pythagorean school of thought, which was partially a religion, partially a philosophy. They were obviously really good at math, but they were also incredibly strict. And they were even cult-like in things like limiting diet, limiting what people could and could not do, uh, a lot of rules in terms of only having sex for making kids and other things like that. And Ludwig Edelson was like, this sounds like all the things said in the Hippocratic Oath. So maybe he wrote it. And probably not Pythagoras himself, but more likely one of his followers, if you believe in his thought. I like a time when everybody, like every prominent physician or like thought leader had a cult. They just like, they had their own cults, right? There's a lot, well, of, no, there's a lot of different They're called cults. schools. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with the fact that I feel like the Pythagorean theorem just got ruined for me. Did you, by the way, did you switch a hypotenuse instead of hypothesis in as a pun back there? Thank you for going even, back. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I was like, for, no, we shouldn't just breeze right past I that. wanted to bring the show to a screeching halt. I don't want to be I obtuse. Really I mean, I think, that. you know, oh, I really, you. <laughs> I, I, wait, I, I feel like they should talk about the cult in elementary school. I think that Can would... you say isosceles, I am going to scream. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you'd be like, hey, we're going to talk about the Pythagorean theorem. Let's make it more interesting for, for you kids. Like, mm-hmm. uh, this guy was also a cult leader. And, uh, and he doesn't he like your rules. <laughs> <laughs> so, true story, Pythagorean theorem story recently. I was making uh, an end table out of uh, wood, and I had to do these cuts so that I made triangles for the base, right? And... I measured the A segment and the B segment, and I squared them, and I knew, thanks to Pythagoras, that this should equal the, the, the square of the, the what I wanted, the hypotenuse, that angled piece. And so I did all this and got like some crazy decimal value and couldn't really make that cut exactly. And then I held up the piece of wood to the thing and I just drew lines on it and then I cut it and it was way more accurate. So I'm just saying I'm a Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem hater questioner. I'm a questioner. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure I believe it. You're a truther. I'm a truther. I'm a Pythagoras. <laughs> Pythagoras was wrong. Man, I had no idea he had a cult. That's crazy. I want a cult now. No, no I Maybe don't. We can have a cult so for much the work. show. Can we have a we cult for the work. show? It's not that much work. Right and then you What's can that? have a cult. Oh, you gotta yeah. write an oath, we need an oath. You have a cult. Right. Gonna... All right, so Brian, you want to write an oath with us? I think you're more of a... Ooh, more of a yeah. let's, let's just freehand. Let's just spend the rest of the episode writing an oath for our cult. Okay, well, maybe we won't do that. But, so, Brian, if Hippocrates... If he may not have written this oath that we are all, you know, going on about, and Greek physicians in his time didn't follow the precepts exactly, like, right, like, they maybe not having objections to doing certain procedures like kidney stones, or, or they were actually performing abortions and those sort of things. How did this, like, become a thing in our, like, modern mythos of medicine? Yeah, I, I think that's one of the fascinating parts, is that nobody really talked about it in Greek times, and there were a few mentions throughout the first few centuries CE, but when it really started to come on was now. And in fact, it never really became popular until now. Um, there was some mention in German medical schools in around the 16th century. There were some in France around the 19th century. But it wasn't until the 20th century that it really caught on in medical schools. Hmm. And scholars looked back into these Hippocratic works, works and the popularity just skyrocketed, not just for the Hippocratic Oath, but for all oaths in general. By the early (laughs) 20th century, around 1900, really only about 10% of medical schools swore oaths. But today, basically 100% uh, swear them now. You don't get that degree without an oath. You got to take an oath. 
Why though? I don't that's, know. For me, it's honestly like, I, I, again, we had said something, but it means something, you know, like, uh, I don't know. It, it, it carries a yeah. weight and importance. You know, you yeah. do that, you all do it together. You've been through some, you know, tough times all together as a class. And then like you're entering this really like a solemn profession, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I'll, talk, I'll even talk to patients about like, I have a duty to give you the most, the, my best understanding of the, the advice or the diagnosis. I mean, I, I owe you that. I certainly feel that or talk about that sometimes openly. I don't re- recite the oath in the room, but. Well, and they trust you maybe in part because you took this oath or they watched <laughs> a movie or they know, yeah, you took an oath. So therefore your word is good. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like it's legally binding, right? Foreshadowing. Uh, uh, That's not. It's not, but we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, there's sort of there's like grows. This is growing fascination with taking oaths, and I think there's 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 benefit to it. Like, I don't want a dog taking an oath for the sake of that. I agree. I think the ritual means something, and I th- I do think that's good. I think it's just kind of funny because this oath is so. 2,500 years old with references to all these Greek gods and all these concepts that we just don't use today, and it it became this like standard, and it's. And now, even though we still refer to it, we're not even saying the actual one because there's so much uh, time period ridiculousness, right? And so I just, I, I, I agree with you, Brian. I think it was kind of a really fun to kind of start going into this. And we've obviously got, got more to talk about here. And I, like, for me personally, one takeaway I had from your book chapter was, you know, on the supposedly foundational oath is that, you know, they can become problematic too, right? Oaths may be a good thing uh, in, in theory, but there's also times you can take an oath and it sort of, there, there, it can be problematic. And here's where you had mentioned and the, you know, going, let's go with the example of the osteopathic oath, right? As I started to read those words in your book, like there's, you get as a DO, you start to get a, uh, there's like a cringe reflex where you're like, oh no, what's coming next? Um, and why? Well, you, you, you actually pointed out one of the fundamental problems with the oath, uh, with oaths in general, but that oath in particular, I completely agree with you. And so what's the problem there? Well, in that oath, or at least the version that you tend to see in a lot of the DO school graduation ceremonies, the, the, I'm going to read the last line and we'll talk about it. So the last line of that adapted oath, which, uh, reads as following quote, I will be ever alert to further the application of basic biologic truths to the healing arts and to develop the principles of osteopathy, which were first enunciated by Andrew Taylor Still. And without going into a huge episode yet yeah, at the moment, it will come down the line. That's the guy who developed at least the, the, the osteopathy practice of medicine. It's a whole thing. We'll go into it later. But, you know, so you point out something that I I don't remember the moment when I was saying it, but if I would have read that, I would have cringed with 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 you on that one because I would have said, "Why are we pledging to a guy who's you know died over way over a hundred years ago?" And yeah, he founded kind of a different way of thinking about medicine, but a lot of his stuff was wrong, and I'll say it: and a lot of his stuff was like really wrong and in you know functionally problematic. And so I feel I think there should be a lot of you should cringe if you're swearing an oath to a person because people people as a general uh, you. You, you can't always count on a person just being a person to be something worth an oath. You know, the problem is you should swear to an idea or, you know, whatnot. But that is, I agree with you. So, like, he is sort of seen as this big figure in osteopathy. And when you actually look at the science behind a lot of his thoughts, it's not there. And so swearing an oath to somebody, you know, who couldn't have predicted how modern medicine would have gone, you know, in the next 150 years is problematic. A.T. still died in 1917, and a modern physician, whether you're a DO or an MD, has way more understanding of how medicine works than he did. And it makes no sense to swear an oath to that guy just because he did something that somebody was impressed with. Yeah, right? but once, right. I mean, that's the same with Hippocrates. Once you become a part of an oath, you're an idea. You're not a person anymore. No, no, but but just swearing as part of that oath, like, I'm going to uphold the fundamentals of medicine that that guy expressed. And that, I think, is inherently dangerous. So... That's just my aside. So sorry, let me silence that real quick. Oh, no. What? Yeah, I don't want to talk to this person. It's okay. If you need to take it, we can pause for a bit. No, it's not important. Who was that? What is that? Uh, that, That's our payphone, Brian. Why why would you have a payphone? Uh, It's just an excellent conversation piece. (laughs) That is an excellent pun. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. 
Aaron, just answer the damn phone. <sighs> Fine. I'm just a cook, a lowly cook, but I'm serving up knowledge and wisdom. Do you know what those words mean to me, Aaron? I, yeah, I know what those words mean, but what do they mean to Steven Seagal? Wisdom is the most important because it starts with a W. That's two U's making it twice as valuable as other letters. You need wisdom to be a warrior, Aaron. I can't teach you wisdom, but I can teach you how to learn. Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not really sure you said anything at all there. To see what is in your path, you have to open your eyes, Aaron. I'm standing in that path. Are your eyes open? Yeah, I, I assure you, my eyes are open. Well, you need to open your heart before your eyes can see. The heart is the source of the warrior's reflexes. Without the heart, there can be no blood. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of things wrong with, with what you said. Yeah. I'm extending this last chance to you, Aaron. Are you going to sign up for my karate classes or not? Yeah, definitely not. Can Can you please stop calling? I take payment of my own new cryptocurrency. Yeah, n- nope, mm-mm, not interested. You want to be in on the ground floor of Glimmer Coin? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna hang up now. Who was it? Yeah, that was Steven Seagal. What? Yeah, our ascension computer that runs the time portal for the show used to fight with Aaron all the time, and then he signed him up for karate lessons with Steven Seagal. This is uh, this is kind of a weird medical history show. Yeah, it really is actually. It really is, but uh, I love is how authentic that what was. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's what I live for. It's, I love it. All right, so we, where were we? We were talking about how this is really an outdated oath, a bunch of specifics to ancient Greek physicians or tropes or whatnot. So what's the big deal? It's not like this is a legally binding argument, right? Uh, right, Brian? It's can't really be held to a legal standard with it. Uh, did that ever happen? Well, um, only only the most important court in the United States, the Supreme Court, no, no. brought it up. Oh, I know. You know, they usually get everything right. I don't know. This surprises me. What's the what's the case there? Well, so it actually came up in multiple instances. Most of it really pertained to abortion or physician-assisted suicide because those are two things that are discussed directly in the original classical Hippocratic Oath. So Roe v. Wade actually had a, a huge discussion about the Hippocratic Oath. Hmm. How did, how did that play out? Well, the way that it basically turned out is the lawyers themselves didn't bring it up too much. But Justice Blackman, who was one of the presiding judges in the case and eventual writer of the majority opinion, said, well, what about the Hippocratic Oath? We're talking about abortion here and saying that physicians can do it here, but they have this Hippocratic Oath that they've been swearing to for thousands of years that forbids it, and we're not going to talk about that at all. So he looked into it himself. He basically went to the library, stumbled across Ludwig Edelson's work, who talked about how the ideals expressed in the oath are incredibly strict, probably not written by a Hippocratic physician and probably not even believed to be the ideals of Greek physicians at that time. Therefore, you know, it really shouldn't bear a legal precedent today. And thankfully, he reached that decision. There were actually a few amicus briefs where people brought opinions forward to the court and suggested that the Hippocratic, court, uh, Hippocratic Oath should be honored and had opinions for that. But thankfully, in Justice Blackmun's majority opinion, he wrote, no, we should, we should not listen to this 2,500-year-old document that we don't know who wrote it, we don't know what it means, it has multiple translations, it is not a legally binding thing. And regardless of whether you're pro-con on these ethical debates, I think not listening to somebody who didn't know what a germ was is probably the right way to go. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah. So That's kind of right a chunk once in a while. Okay, okay. That's, That's it's kind fair. of fascinating that his initial understanding, though, was this is an oath that physicians have sworn for thousands of years. Like that was his starting point of his understanding of how the oath worked. And and in reality, you've pointed out it, it's like a hundred years old at 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 most, which is well, yeah. good for him for doing the research we, too. I mean, that, yeah. especially in something like this, you know, to have it potentially changes argument or at least to include it or not to include it yeah that make i mean that in 
It could be, imagine the legal quagmire for like having to, <laughs> why did you, you do a urological surgery? It was against the oath though. Mm-hmm. You weren't supposed to cut out the stone. So <laughs> you are, you are hosed. You, sorry. It is All written, urologists so. are just suddenly unemployed. <laughs> like, yeah. sorry, you can't cut for stones, man. I think we need them. I think we should keep them around. So I think this was a good decision. Mm-hmm. How did it, uh, Brian, how did it come up with uh, the assisted suicide? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that, that came up in the state of Washington. Uh, the big court case against Washington State that determined whether or not physician-assisted suicide could be legal. Uh, They, too, discussed the Hippocratic Oath, but they then looked back at Justice Blackmun's opinion, which was in the late 1960s, early 1970s, when he did most of his research and published his opinion, and they found that to be the precedent. So, in a way, it's good that it came up in Roe v. Wade because it established the precedent of, we should probably not listen to the original Hippocratic Oath in terms of legal precedent. So, when they wrote it in the opinion of uh, Washington State's decision, it thankfully also ignored the original ideals in the Hippocratic Oath. Again, there were people who brought it up and tried to use it as an argument for or even against uh, physician-assisted suicide, but thankfully we have uh, hopefully bitten that and stopped it. Yeah, and this and this also surrounded you know, Dr. Jack Kevorkian, right? This uh, didn't did this did that case have to do with what he was doing at the time? I I can't remember if it was directly related or it just kind of came up tangentially. It it was brought up a lot in his arguments, a lot in his interviews, and for the audience here, Jack Kevorkian is is how I start that chapter because it is a fascinating narrative of a guy who was just such a character Mm. and his court case speaks a lot about how he operated. Um, He basically went around with various machines in performing physician assisted suicide. And then when it culminated in one case where a patient with ALS wanted physician assisted suicide, he not only did it, but he videotaped himself and then aired it on 60 Minutes. And the bold said, move, Cotton. Hey, kind of the bold move. <laughs> vaguely remember that too. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. It turns out uh, recording yourself breaking the law is not a good strategy. But his goal was to challenge the law. He wanted to take it to court to challenge it. His next mistake was that he chose to represent himself. He mm. referred to himself in terms of famous people like Susan B. Anthony and Martin Luther King Jr. So he kind of acquitted himself to those people. Another bold people. move. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Double bold move. And it wasn't brought up in his court case because his court case lasted about two days before yeah. he went to jail. Yeah, did did he re- refer to himself in the third person? I, I feel I, I man, that would be I, great. I, you know, I'm not sure, but if you're talking about yourself in reference to Martin Luther King Jr., I feel like that would just fit perfectly if it was yeah. third person. It's like yeah, Dr. Yeah, King says, yeah, it's almost too bad because because the issue of physician assisted suicide, I think, is a valid topic of discussion for well, sure. Well, maybe it helped like bring up some of the end of life discussions that we have. Actually, oh, funny man. aside, just at work last week, I walked into <laughs> funny a room. Aside, I like where this is jumping. Oh, I walked okay. into a room and this guy looks at me and it's busy, right? It's one of those days where it's busy and you have very limited time. So you walk I walk in the room and you know, the guy goes, Dr. Kevorkian, I presume. And I was like <laughs> <God>. <laughs> And I wanted to just turn around and walk out and just put in a bunch of orders. <laughs> Like, are you walk in with like a black lab coat or no, no white it's lab just coat. It, it is covered in. So you know how our Gatorade is carbonated. Sorry about this, Brian. It's uh, it has nothing to do with anything, but it's carbonated, so like it gets really fizzy, and I spilled it all over my jacket. But it looks like I'm covered in blood. <laughs> so and you were we walking around with a Gatorade dry cleaning companies, so now our coats don't get washed. <laughs> So you you didn't just take the coat off? That didn't occur to you? Come no, on. No, no. Because my scrubs had a hole in the pocket. You thought it was salutary pus? Is that what you thought? Like just you're showing how good a surgeon you yeah, are that like you a had blood, a stiff coat full of blood? Frog. Yeah, yeah, excellent. There's an interesting discussion to be had here. The problem is that the way that I think uh, Kevorkian comported himself is that he took a serious topic that is worth discussing and worth exploring and kind of became this sort of showman figurehead for it and it cast it in uh, probably the light that would be opposite of what would be helpful to the discussion is, is I think, the, the general take on it. We possibly could do an episode on him at some point. Yeah. I, uh, especially looking for episodes where the humor flows easily. I don't, <laughs> nah, you know. End of life care, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I no. mean, in, in his defense, while he was a zealot, uh, we're talking about it. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was really his goal is he wanted to do it as big and as loud as he possibly could. And I'm sure he knew he was going to go to jail. Mm -hmm. Uh, He just thought that doing 60 Minutes, doing interviews on CNN, doing all these ancillary things in addition to the actual court case. By the way, the court case was was on TV. He Mm -hmm. would say, hey, to the world, let's talk about this. Yeah, I think I think that is a fair. Did get some point across. Did he? He right. died in jail, didn't he? No, I, I I actually think he was not. I don't know if he was pardoned or released early. Oh, okay, but I think he made it out of jail and then died a couple of years after. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. Let's see here. He died from a thrombosis on June third, two thousand eleven, eight days after his eighty third birthday at uh, Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan. Big name there. Beaumont. It's his own other separate story. Uh, was he in? I don't know that he was incarcerated. It doesn't doesn't no, say he's in the hospital. Looks like well, yeah. either way. Either way. So the oath itself, we've already kind of established a bit. It's kind of problematic in its original form, at least for modern medicine. And so you know, alternatives basically to the Hippocratic oath came up and have been suggested, and they include something discussed in the book called the Declaration of Geneva which is nice and all, but I would rather move to adopt the lasagna oath based on name alone because I'm sure Dr. Provolone took this oath no. when he graduated from his uh, medical school. Is that correct? <laughs> hey. What is the lasagna oath, Brian? Well, the lasagna oath is uh, an oath created by Dr. Louis Lasagna, and Real he name. was in the mid-20th century. <laughs> he was a very likable guy. I mean, he was a prominent physician, knew what he was doing, served on multiple boards, and he wrote this New York Times Filled with piece. ricotta cheese. <laughs> <laughs> there were layers to his personality. <laughs> oh. I heard he had a drug problem. He was baked all the time. All right. Okay. Sorry. 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 Continue, no, please. We digest. Oh, that was excellent. <laughs> those, those were excellent. Uh, um, he wrote this New York Times piece, and he basically said, I think Hippocrates would rewrite his oath now. And in a very likable way, he said, you know, I think I shouldn't necessarily be the one to create it, but somebody should. We should have an oath in medicine. And I humbly submit this as my submission for consideration. So he wrote this oath and it's sworn at a lot of medical schools and throughout the late 20th century, it was actually much more common than the original Hippocratic Oath. If you swore an oath in an allopathic medical school, you either probably swore this one or you swore one created by your own medical school. That makes sense. And he's, uh, and this was like 1920s when this was all happening? Disagree. Yeah. Oath. yeah. I, I, I think yeah. the New York Times piece was 1930s. I think I might have remembered okay. this one. Maybe not. Yeah, and it, I think, as you mentioned, like it, it, he did actually when you when I was reading a chapter, it was it, this was a very likable person. It just it came through because of the way that he said, "Look, hey, I think we need a new oath. I'm not going to say that I'm the expert to write it. I'll throw something out there just to get get us started here. But we should really kind of rethink this and rewrite this as you know, kind of time goes on, or have a committee of learned physicians or whomever we feel is most reasonable to do this. That's just a very forth thinking." way to write you know a, something that you consider to be a potentially important and foundational document or, or or oath or phrasing and that sort of thing so i i do i i really liked dr lasagna's approach it's and name I, yeah this is fabulous this first my first exposure to it but avoiding mm-hmm. the twin traps of over treatment and therapeutic nihilism i mean that's wow nailed it that's yeah, and I mean, like the, the, in your closing chapter, you I think you chose the right like summary quote from it, and from Doctor Lasagna himself, it was quote, "Let's let a distinguished committee of physicians and men of letters select a covenant which best captures the spirit of noble profession with, with great traditions, lest the new physician forget both his heritage and his responsibilities." And end quote, and acknowledging the little bit of dated gendered use of language there, uh, you know, he was a physician in the 1920s. I think the the whole message was spot on. I mean, uh... yeah, and and I think what he's getting at, and I we think we talked about this a little bit earlier, is that oaths have a lot of good use. I mean, we are physicians; we have duties to our patients; we have ethical standards that we should ascribe to, but we probably shouldn't derive them from a two thousand five hundred year old document that we don't know who wrote or even what it means. We should probably create our own contemporary ethical ideals and ascribe to those. It's good to write them down on paper and codify them. And I agree with them. I think, you know, I also probably shouldn't be the one to write it. 
but a bunch of experts could get together and create a contemporary Hippocratic Oath. Obviously, it was a lot of kind of interesting, eye-opening information about oaths and what we do traditionally in medicine, whether or not we may have a good reason to. And so I feel like somebody should examine all these things and maybe compile them into a book or something that would be fun to read and just kind of <laughs> take a look at it. Uh, Brian, do you know anybody who's done that? Um, you know, I don't think anyone's done it yet, but come January 27th, uh, it, it will be done. Seamless. It'll be out there. Nice. Seamless. So yeah, nice once again, the, the book is uh, coming out January 27th, as you mentioned, White Coat Ways, examining seven major kind of I don't know, myths, is it myths or traditions? What would you prefer? Medical I call traditions, it? yeah. Medical traditions, there we go. Uh, examining these things, and in, in they include, as we alluded to before, you know, why do we do, what's up with the physical exam? What's up with the white coats? You know, and, you know, what's up with this oath and other things like that? So uh, definitely a good read. Uh, we will have a link to the book, not only in our show notes, but on our website from here on out. So if you're listening to this show, episode and you're like that is fascinating and if you are a resident or a medical student or a physician or none of those things take a look at the subject material it is very accessible it's very easy to gain you don't need to be a medical insider and it's probably in its own level a different type of fascination if you're not you know why why does your doctor do these things and and we as doctors should sit and go why do we do these things because there's an often may not be a good reason to it's just the way we've always done it and that's never a satisfying explanation is it no but that's what mike says all the time so Wait, what do i say <laughs> exactly D's nuts. just because we've done things that way isn't a satisfying explanation for why we do it now correct yeah. i'm a contrarian behind you on the wall. A... Yeah, you are. <laughs> that says live, you're, laugh, you're, love. It says live, laugh, love. <laughs> you're a productive contrarian, right? No, live, laugh, love. Like, Dude, why are live, we doing laugh, it love. that way? That's dumb. <laughs> why do you well, put with, writing on your walls, Mike? With all of that, I want to thank Dr. Brian Elliott for coming onto the show, sharing the uh, book with us, sharing the topic with us, and uh, participating in, in, in the goofiness that is the Poor Historians podcast. I, I hope you had as much fun as I know you had, Brian. <laughs> Oh, I did. The puns were excellent. Right? <laughs> See, hear that, Max? Yes, thank the you. Puns yeah, hear that? Hear that, Max? Come, to the, come for the promotion. Stay for the puns. You know, That's the thing is, say, Brian, yeah. he's going to cut them, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 now, Brian, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take every kind thing you've said during the show, and I'm going to put a super cut that is just self-aggrandizing <laughs> to myself, uh, because I am just play it in the and morning. I need that for my ego. Just play it in the it's... morning for, as you're brushing your teeth and write it on your <laughs> Absolutely. No, but we do, really do thank you for coming on. Wish you absolutely all the best in oh, your congratulations. upcoming fellowship. And oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, this like is how great. Is, how is chief year? Because so that's chief. so you're internal medicine. So you do three, and then chief is an additional year, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. We hang around for the uh, victory lap, as I call yeah. it, or or the cheap labor, <laughs> cheap attending labor. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from all of you out there. If you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com. There you will find links to our social media sites. We take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com, and we, let, we work to respond to all posts on our various social media accounts. If you have time, please go and leave us a nice five-star review on iTunes or whichever platform you choose. And usually here I'd put in a call to action about telling a friend about the show, but let's switch it up a little bit. How about you... Find a complete stranger on the street and tell them about the show. Maybe walk up <laughs> to somebody unprompted on a bus or something and tell them uh, what you're listening to. Strangers love spontaneous conversations on public transportation, so don't worry. The bus is loud. Just start yelling or shouting a little bit louder how much you love the show. And that way, all the other passengers around them will be able to hear. So thanks in advance for doing that uh, and taking all that time and energy. If you'd like to support the show in other ways, please check out the Poor Historians merchandise, including t-shirts, mugs, all that sort of thing. That is over on our website, which will be linked in the notes. And if you're old-fashioned, call us collect, but say whatever you want to say in like that one-second moment it gives you to tell, you, tell us your name, and we'll probably decline the charges anyhow. It's not the most efficient form of communication. That just happened to me recently. A phone call really? was a collect call, yeah. In 2022 or 2023? Yes. Well, it was from a place where you often cannot have a telephone from the jail <laughs> it's a long story yeah got a lot of friends in there huh mm -hmm. got friends yeah, in low places yeah it's all right people are people sometimes they're in low places until next time poor historians are signing out ama um yeah <clears throat> no i can't do that <laughs> i was gonna try to get my voice to crack are we 
I guess I'm an adult when I'm a med student, right? It's All okay. Right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, most yeah, med students are adults, easy. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so long. I mean, like, you, were, I think, you were Doogie Howser, but... I might have been yeah. 14 when I started. That's one of the greatest lines I've ever written. <laughs> D's nuts. <laughs> Poor Brian really like, to sit through that. Mike delivered that, too, with a lot of oomph. <laughs> Do you know yeah, what was medical school uh, like sorry, in Brian, the seventies? Sorry, Brian. I apologize, dude. I was born in seventy four. Yeah, mm. that's that's not boomer. <laughs> so, Brian, guess who's the youngest of the group here? Uh, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Touche, sir. Well done. Touché. <laughs> We're old. So go to www.arteryinc.com. So go to www.arteryinc.com, that's arteryinc, I-N-K.com, 